Hi, this is Frank Taylor with Nature at Your Door. And today, I'm not at my door in Floyd County, Virginia. I'm at the door of my camper van conversion here. And there's some great nature right outside my door in this campground. I am parked underneath this magnificent live oak tree where you can see I've got Spanish moss hanging from it, the tree. And this Spanish moss is fascinating. This episode is going to be about Spanish moss. I'm going to tell you what it actually is and where it fits in in the plant kingdom. I'll explain how it lives and how it's different from other plants. And I have to tell you, it's not Spanish and it's not moss. So stay tuned. Check out my video on Spanish moss. Right here in your backyard. You never know what you're going to find. And here's the make this invasive. To the top. Dogwoods are flowering. And I just took a couple swipes. Terrestrial environment. Uh, produce seed pollen. And it's. So nature is always right outside your door, whether it's your house or the door of your car when you're traveling. Look at this magnificent tree. This is a live oak, which this area is known for. And I'm on Tybee Island in the state of Georgia on the uh, coast. And I'm just probably a quarter mile from the ocean itself. And you can see hanging from these trees is Spanish moss. And look at that, isn't that amazing? And it's hanging all over the branches of so many of these trees. Let's take a closer look at this Spanish moss. And it's funny because it really does look like it's hanging down, like almost like a beard. And you can see that it's just barely attached here with the plant intertwining some of these leaves. So as you can see, Spanish moss will grow pretty much everywhere. It prefers live oak and cypress, but it'll pretty much grow on any tree that it might be able to gain a foothold as long as it's got enough humidity, moisture during a period of time that it's growing. Spanish moss when hanging in a tree will appear almost gray as this Spanish moss is right here. But I took some and put some in a bowl and let it get wet and you can see that it's it's very green and it does photosynthesis so in this stage it's inactive sort of dormant and then when it rains it takes in a lot of water and turns green and you can see how green the leaves are on this plant also notice that the plant is made up of leaves and stems but no roots and we'll talk about that some more a little bit later. So the next thing I want to talk about is exactly what is this? What kind of organism is this? Well the first thing I need to tell you it's not a moss. Mosses are in a group called the bryophytes and they don't flower and this actually does flower and so it's a true flowering plant. It's in the angiosperm category. The Spanish moss is actually in the bromeliad family, whose most familiar member is the pineapple. And Spanish moss is an epiphyte. Epiphytes are plants that grow on other plants. However, Spanish moss, while being an epiphyte, and it does grow on other plants, it's not a parasite. It's not a parasite. They don't take any water or nutrition from the host plant. They just live on it. In fact, one of the unusual things about Spanish moss is it has no roots, it has stems, leaves, and flowers, but no roots on it at all. And while it's not a parasite, it can harm the host plant if it grows in large enough quantities. It can cover up the plant, preventing the leaves of the plant from getting sunlight from the sun. It just covers up all the leaves. And also it can be a problem when it gets wet, especially in a storm, because it will contain all this water and weigh down the branches and cause the branches to potentially break during the storm when it's raining. As a true flowering plant, it does flower. 
And much of the summer, there's yellow to brown, maybe almost bluish, dark, not very showy flowers that hang from this plant for several months. And it, those flowers produce seeds. And the seeds can be compared to dandelion seeds in that they're windblown. So when the flower is fertilized and it produces a seed, the seed is released into the wind and it's carried by the wind perhaps to another tree and to the proper habitat for it to grow. A lot of its reproduction, however, is asexually or vegetatively, without sexual reproduction, without pollen and ovules. And simply a piece of the stem might break off and get blown by the wind and land on another branch and the scales and the twisty nature of it, you can see how twisty this thing is, will cling on to that and then it will start another plant. These pieces that break off are called festoons. And it has another biological, purposeful, reproductive method that's also vegetative. It'll create little pieces of the plant that are intended to break off that are called pups. And the pups, again, are blown by the wind or carried by an animal or a bird. And if the pup lands on an appropriate place, it'll start to grow into one of these plants uh, intertwining with itself. Hey, it's not Spanish and it's not a moss. It's actually native to North America and the Caribbean area, the shores of South America on this side of, of the continent. Uh, is how did it get its name Spanish moth? Because it's actually a native. It's not from Spain at all. It's native to the regions I described to you. And it's not a moss. So where did this name Spanish moss come from? To make a long story short, there was a lot of naming and changing of names. But what ended up sticking was the fact that this looks like a beard on a conquistador. The Spanish conquistadors. And the French named it Barbe Español or Spanish beard. So it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination. Picture this as Spanish beard, does it? So with a series of name changes, and it's another neat story to research. If you have time, check it up on Google. Too long a story to tell here, but if you're interested in naming, look it up. It's a pretty cool story. The fifth thing I wanted to mention was the uses of this plant. And it was used by the indigenous peoples of this country long before settlers came. The sinews in it uh, can be made into ropes and strings and then again ultimately in fabric. Some of the settlers used this to mix with mud and create building blocks and some of those building block houses that they built are still standing today. Another unusual use was it was it in car seats and <laughs> pads for, for car seats. When you pack this together, it's very fluffy. It was also used to stuff cushions and sofas and mattresses before we had synthetic fibers. Because unlike some of the other natural products, moss wouldn't eat this stuff. And so it made a very good fiber or stuffing to use in cushions and mattresses. Lastly, I have to med mention for some of my friends in Radford, that they say, they've come here, and I don't have personal experience with this, but they said, oh, stay out of Spanish moss because there's red bugs in there, there's chiggers in there. And chiggers and red bugs are little hemipterans that bite you for a blood meal to feed, provide nutrition for their eggs. My experience, I don't know, but uh, I looked it up and did some research. My research says it's more Spanish moss that's fallen on the ground that has the chiggers in it. And those sources I read about said that you wouldn't find the chiggers in this moss here, but that's up in the air in a tree. But that's still subject to debate. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Nature, not at my door, but at my van door. I was really excited to see the Spanish moss, and I just really couldn't get over it. And I'm my van is parked in this campground under this magnificent live oak tree with Spanish moss hanging from it, as well as some other epiphytes. There's some green ferns that are growing on this tree as well. Remember, I think I'm always supposed to say, hey, don't forget to subscribe and give me a like and leave me a comment. I do really love to have your comments. So if you have comments or thoughts, please share them on my YouTube channel. Thanks for watching Nature at Your Door.